we have a router and here's a router beautiful router we'll call this guy router one and so router one has several interfaces he's got one there and one there and one there and one there and we'll say these are for the purposes of education we'll make these loopback interfaces so we don't have to actually be physically connecting but we can have these loopback interfaces and let's have this be loopback zero and loopback one and loopback two and loopback three so in the process of, of loopback interfaces, just think of them as a logical interface. You can assign an IP address to them. They don't move a whole lot of traffic because they're not physical interfaces, but they, they can be used as far as um, IP addresses. And that's going to help us out as we take a look at OSPF and their wildcard statements that we use with the network statements for OSPF. So on these interfaces, let's use the following. Let's use the IP address of 10.16.0.1 with a 24-bit mask. So a 24-bit mask means that there's 24 bits from this IP address going from left to right that are being used that represent the network. So we have eight bits here, eight bits here, eight bits here. And the 24 simply says the first 24 bits, eight times three is 24, are gonna be the network and that leaves this last number as the host. And we'll talk more about that in the, in the uh, subnet Saturdays. So this is a 10.16.0.1. Ten sixteen zero network, and let's say up here we have the um, the eleven dot fourteen dot three dot five address. Actually, I'm going to make the last octet one to make it seventy two dot sixteen dot. And let's go ahead and use a uh, sixty four dot one, and let's use a slash uh, twenty eight here. Okay, for a twenty eight bit mask. And then over here, we'll do a 190. I want to jot these down so that as we're configuring the network masks, or the wildcard statements to include these networks, I can get them all in. So I'm going to go ahead and put it up and I'm going to jot them down real quick. So 10.16.0.1 slash 24 is loop back zero. And loop one is 10, actually it's 11. You know what, I'm going to change that because I can. Let's use a private RFC 1918 address, why not? All right, so that's 10.14.3.1 with a 24-bit mask, and that's loopback one. And then we have loopback two, which is 172.16.64.1. And if you have opportunity where you're at right now uh, to jot these down as well, it'll help because if you have them jotted down, then as I'm in the interface, we're going back and forth with network statements, you can be very clear with where stuff is and what the mask is. 28 uh, is the mask for that, and then loop three is 192.168.1.225 with a 29-bit mask. All right, okay, so I've got them. Hope you've got them. And let's go ahead, let me take, I'm gonna label this layer so I can find it again. I'm gonna call this uh, interfaces. And let me actually hide that layer for a moment and let me bring up a new one. And let's talk about um, let's talk about how OSPF network statements operate. So let me go ahead and hide that, bring up a new layer, and all right. So to configure OSPF, the basics of it with OSPF, there are a few things that we need to know to make it work. And one of those things is we need to have a, pro, um, a process ID. So the process ID is simply a number between one and I forget what the, ever high, the high range is, but it's basically, think of it like an application. You know, if you have like a cell phone and we're gonna run an app, um, if you have one app running, no problem, but if you have two apps running, it needs to keep them separate. Well, in some instances, not very often, especially not the, the associate level and not even too much at the professional level, but at the expert level, you might have to run two or three separate instances of OSPF on a router, and if you do so, you have to have a separate instance number for each one of them. So a lot of times people use number one, like router OSPF one, process ID one, and boom, it's running and away they go. So if you have to ever, ever, ever have to run two or three or four, that's why they have a process number you can identify. So you can have more than just one. It's like running the same app twice, two instances of OSPF if you need it. So we need a process ID and for our plan, let's use a process ID of one. And then also with OSPF, there's a thing called a router ID. Now, the router ID, um, 
if there's three ways you can set it or have it set, you can actually specify it. S P E C I F Y. Specify it with the router ID command. And it's simple. Uh, router ID in OSPF router configuration mode. You say, here is what I want you to be, and boom, that takes effect immediately. And that's the router ID for that router. So if we have five or six routers, the router IDs all have to be unique. Uh, we're going to have problems if you have two routers on the same segment that want to become neighbors and they have the same router ID. That's a problem. So the router ID that we're going to configure on these devices, if you, if you can manually configure it, and um, that's great. If you want to, you can configure that manually. Or, or if you don't configure it manually, it's going to take the highest IP address on a loopback. So if we have a loopback interface or, or a dozen loopback interfaces and those interfaces are all up, assuming they're all up, it's going to, if it hasn't been specifically configured, it's going to use the highest IP address on any loopback interface as the router ID. Now, what happens if we didn't specify it and we don't have any loopbacks, then what does it do? The third choice, it chooses the actual highest IP address on a, in, on a, I should say a non-loopback interface. I'm going to call it a, can I say real? On a real interface. All of that could include a sub-interface for inter-VLAN routing and so forth. But the highest IP address on a real interface, um, and all these, all these are applicable when OSPF is starting. So if you and I didn't configure a router ID, and then we boot up OSPF at that moment, it, we turn it on. That moment, it would actually look at the highest IP address on any loopbacks. No loopbacks, it would then take a look at the highest IP address on any active interface, and that would take it. Uh, word to the wise, don't let OSPF pick its own router ID, hard code it, and that solves the problem. But that is the pecking order, and from a CCNA perspective, understanding that pecking order is important. So let's make a plan, and our plan is going to be we are going to specify the router ID. And let's go ahead and have the router ID, uh, if it's router one, we'll go ahead and use a router ID of 1.1.1.1. And if it's router two, we do 2.2.2.2. And that's how we'll go ahead and specify it. So that's gonna be the router ID that we're gonna use. Um, the other thing we need to do in OSPF is we need to specify to that router, it knows it's running OSPF, it knows it's router ID, we need to tell that router which of its interfaces are going to be participating in OSPF. Let's imagine we have a router with 10 interfaces. Ooh, 10 interfaces. So it's got 10 interfaces, and maybe we want OSPF to participate in some of those interfaces, but not others. So basically think of it like um, OSPF is running, and now, based on the which interfaces we choose, which interfaces are going to send and receive the LSAs and form adjacencies and, and be advertised. Those networks should be advertised. So it's interesting, I think, I think it's really interesting about how we tell OSPF which uh, interfaces are going to participate. And the way we do it, there's actually a, there's an interface option, but the way we do it in router configuration mode is with network statements. And let me show you how that works. A network statement simply says to the router, Dear Mr. Router, um, if you have, it's like go fish, really. That's, that's a pretty good analogy. It's like go fish. It's like telling the router, you got any threes? Yeah, great. That's part of OSPF. Uh, Dear Mr. Router, you got any fours? Go fish. And then he goes, okay, so I don't have any fours. I'm not going to um, put that in, in OSPF. So it has, we're going to ask the router to do some looking at his cards and based on what his cards have, those interfaces may or may not become part of OSPF. Now what we're going to ask is, we're going to tell the router, hey, if you have any interfaces that have IP addresses in these networks, or if you have certain IP addresses that begin with this series of numbers, then those interfaces become part of OSPF. And that's what the network statement does for us. And let me show you the network statement. So if you have interfaces in, let's see here, the uh, the 10.16.0.0 slash 24 network, go ahead and add those interfaces to OSPF. So if you're thinking, Keith, are you saying that 
we're going to specify what networks should be in OSPF. And then the router looks at its real time, looks at its interfaces and says, oh, I, I'm connected to that network or I have an interface that has those three octets for the first three octets. And based on that match, it's going to go ahead and say, well, that matches 10.16.0. I've got an, a network interface that has that IP address that starts with 10.16.0. Because it's a match with the network statement, I'm going to add that interface and make it part of OSPF. That's how it works. So it's like an indirect process. We tell the router which interfaces, they are, which um, IP addresses or network spaces that we want in OSPF. It looks at its interfaces, and when it sees it has a match, it adds that interface and whatever network's connected to that interface into OSPF. That's how it works. And we'll do a couple good examples here. In fact, um, Let's, let's do this one first. Um, we've got enough to work with with loopback zero, which is what this guy is. Uh, loopback zero is 10, or it will be when we configure it, 10.16.0.1 with a 24-bit mask. So here's how we write the network statement in OSPF. We'd say network. In fact, let me put that in a slightly different color to make it more readable so it'll stand out as a configuration command. That'll make it easier for you. So we'd use the command network space, and then we're going to specify what we want to have match. Let's imagine we want these first three octets to go ahead and match. So we say network 10.16.0 dot, and then for the last octet, we just leave it as a zero. And this is the, this is the part where we're going to introduce the wildcard mask. When you think of a wildcard mask, think of it doesn't matter, meaning wherever the bits are on in the wildcard mask, this, the router says, hey, the administrator, the guy who configured me, he put in this wildcard mask that says, I don't care about that last octet. All I have to do is match on the 10.16.0, and for the last octet, I don't care what it is. It could be a .2 or a .10 or a .9 or a .40. It doesn't matter because the wildcard mask, those bits say, I don't care about it. Here's what the syntax would look like. The wildcard mask, I'm going to put a space. This is my symbol for a space, a little triangle. It would say network 10.16.0.0, and then I care about matching on this first number, the 10. I care about matching on the second number, the 16. I care about matching the third number, the 0. But check this out. For that last number, the router could have a dot .10 or a dot .2 or a dot .1 or a dot .90. doesn't matter. We put a 255 there. And what that says is I don't care. And I'll circle that in red. So... This 255 of the wildcard mask, which equates to this last octet of the IP address that we're putting in here, or this network statement, simply says, I don't care about any of those eight bits. Doesn't matter what they are. So the router could be 10.16.0.10 or 20 or 30 or 40. It wouldn't matter what that last number was of the router's interface address because this wildcard mask says, well, as long as you have 10.16.0 that match, um, that interface that has that IP address is going to become part of OSPF. Now, the last piece of the network statement is, I'll put a space here, area zero. And with OSPF, one of the misconceptions that I'm gonna, it took me uh, a while back in the early days when I was first learning OSPF to kind of get the idea of this, is that with OSPF, it's more accurate to say that networks belong to OSPF areas as opposed to routers belong to OSPF areas. Meaning, um, when we think of OSPF, it's better initially to think of each interface and the networks connected to those interfaces belonging to certain OSPF areas. So with CCNA, it's just area zero, which means that there's if you have 10 routers and all the networks are associated with area zero, that means all those router interfaces and all those networks are going to be sharing LSAs, link state advertisements from the routers, and they'll have to learn everybody else's interfaces and how to reach everywhere in that network. So if you have a, a huge network with thousands of routers, we wouldn't want just one area because then it means every router would have to learn all the details about every other router in the area and all the routes, and there's a lot of overhead. So in larger networks, we start carving it up into multiple areas. And, and the cool is, the cool thing is like rooms. Instead of having a room of like 300 people or 500 people, and we have to memorize everybody's names of everybody in that room, we can go ahead and chop that up into five rooms of 100 people each. 
and you only have to really memorize everybody in your own local room, and then you know who's standing by the door. And in OSPF, the person that's standing by the door between one area and another area is called the area border router. But for CCNA, that's above and beyond the scope of that. But come see us in Encore. Uh, we'll talk more about that in CCMP level in great detail um, with multiple areas. But I wanted to give you a big picture of how it works. So going back to this uh, example, what I think we had to do is implement this and then um, show you that this interface, loopback zero, if we use this network statement and this wildcard mask, that it would become part of our OSPF process. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna size up my screen real quick to make sure I have the right, the right size. And almost there. Hold on one second. In fact, I'll show you while I do it to you. I'll show you while I do it. That's what I meant to say. And let me go ahead and log on. And there we have router one. Let me just line this up nice and perfect. Okay, all right, so we have router one. First thing, if you've been with me in a few live streams, which I know many of you have, and I'm so grateful or watching this recording, one of the first things that I'm gonna do when I get on a new device is I wanna verify what's there, make sure I'm on the right device before I start configuring because the CLI on many devices, they look pretty much the same and uh, the difference between switch two and switch three could be a RPE. RP stands for a resume producing event when you bring the whole network down because you configured something on the wrong device. Um, I haven't lost a job because of that, but I have totally trashed a network at least once because I was on the wrong device. Um, many, many years ago, it only takes once to really learn it. So learn from my mistakes, make sure you're on the right device before you configure. All right, so here we are on router one. We'll do a show IP interface brief. All right, hey, good start. So this router has, <laughs> Um, nothing up, which is the default state for a router. So let's go ahead and create our loopback interfaces. Interface loopback zero. Actually, you know what? Let's enable OSPF first, and then we'll bring in the loopbacks. Let's do that. So router OSPF process ID one. We'll set the router ID to 1.1.1.1. See that right there? I love it. I said, I can't even start because there's no interfaces and the router ID is not set. And because there's no interfaces, loopback or otherwise, I can't select a router ID. So um, this will help him and we'll do a do show IP protocols and just to make sure it's running. All right, so OSPF is uh, now running. The router ID is 1111 and uh, we are on our way. So let's add a network statement. Network, and then we'll put in the network of, I'm looking at my notes, 10.16.0.0. And now we'll put in the wildcard mask. And, and this is, um, when we're putting the wildcard mask, we're simply saying, do we care about matching on the 10? If so, the wildcard bits would be in that position, would be a zero, meaning we want to match exactly on the first octet. So wherever the wildcard bits are on, that's the part we don't care about. Then we, regarding the second number here, the 16, if we want to match on that, we would put a zero for the wildcard mask at that point for the second octet. And then for the third octet, if we want that to match, we would simply add another zero and a period. And then for this last octet, we uh, if we don't care, if we don't care about matching on that last octet, this is where we could put in the 255 for the wildcard mask. And that simply says, you know that last octet of the IP address? Uh, we don't care what it is, just have a party. And that way the router says, great, I get it. So it looks at its interfaces and it says any interfaces I have that begin with 10, 16, zero, regardless of the last octet, because the wildcard mask says we don't care about that, but any interfaces that have an IP address that starts with 10.16.0, it'll go ahead and say, wow, that matches the network statement. I'm going to add this interface as part of OSPF into this area. And we have to specify the area too. And that's the last part of the syntax. So we'll put a wildcard mask for the last octet there and then we'll use some context sensitive help and we need to set the area. And for CCNA purposes, I'm putting everything in area zero. So boom, done. Now, if we do a show IP OSPF interface and I'm just adding the do command right there because I'm in configuration mode and I don't wanna drop out, do the show command, then come back in because I just wanna do it right here. So check this out. Show me 
I'm asking the router. We're asking the router. Show me all the interfaces that currently are participating in OSPF. And the router says, okay. Well, the network statement said 10.16.0. I have no interfaces that begin with 10.16.0 that are up. So at the moment, I have no interfaces participating in OSPF. So let's add one. Let's add a loopback that'll be participating based on a match. So we'll exit out to global configuration mode and let's create interface loopback zero and we'll give it the IP address of 10.16.0.1 with a 24-bit mask. And boom, the moment we do that, if we hit the up arrow key a few times and we do a show IP OSPF interface, uh, and I'm also going to add the keyword of brief on there. It's now showing us that we have, as far as interfaces participating in OSPF, we have loopback zero. Here's its IP address. It's in area zero. It's running as part of OSPF process ID number one. And it has some state information because the loopback is not going to be too helpful here. But that was just added. Now, if we did this, let's do this. Let's change the IP address on this loopback interface. If we change the IP address to, how about 254, which is the last valid IP address on that subnet. And we'll learn more about that in subnet, subnet Saturdays. But we change the IP address and we had to do a show IP OSPF interface. Well, let's do a show IP interface brief. Show IP interface brief. So we've got this IP address 10.16.0.254. My question is, based on our network statement, and we can do a do show IP protocols to get a good to get a good idea of that. So show IP protocols is a great command. Oh my gosh, it's a winner um, because it's going to show us our dynamic routing protocols. Also, it shows us right here our network statement, which I love. So based on this network statement, and based on us changing this IP address on the loopback zero to ten sixteen zero dot two fifty four, my question is. Is that loopback zero interface still going to be associated and part of OSPF? Because we just changed that last octet. And here's, here's the part I want to have soak in. Because the wildcard mask, and I'm going to point it out right here. In fact, let me get my pen out. Do, 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 do. Here we go. So because this wildcard mask right there, is 255, which means I don't care what's in the last octet. The fact that we changed that customer, the router's interface IP address from dot one to dot 254, from an OSPF perspective, is still going to match because this first three parts, the 10.16.0, still matches. <laughs> now, who's gonna, who, who is that going to cause a problem for though? Well, if you have 40 clients or 100 clients in a VLAN and they're all expecting to point to a default gateway that they learn via DHCP, uh, that's a problem. So uh, it would cause a problem for clients who are expecting a default gateway to be at dot one, for example, to just change it to dot 254. But the point here is that the router, because the last octet is the wildcard mask for the network statement, doesn't care, still part of it. And we can verify that with a really cool show command, such as uh, do show IP OSPF interface brief, just like that. So there it is, it's still there. Now, if we wanted to, we could also do something like this. Let's go to router configuration mode. And I'm gonna hit the up arrow key a few times and let's do a, uh, if it's in my history. <laughs> uh, I guess it isn't anymore. All right, so we'll take it out. So the history is only so big. So we'll do a no network. 10.16.0.0 with the mask of this area zero. All right, and let's just do a quick check. I always, it's a really good idea when you make a change, just verify, like a, a third party source or a different command that it took. That way you're com comfortable that, okay, what I, what I meant to change, it got changed. So we, we should expect now is that no interfaces are participating in OSPF because we have no network statements. Let's do a do show IP protocols. That's great. So that shows us for OSPF that it's running. It shows the router ID, but we've got no network statement. <laughs> if 
fantastic. And if you do a show IP OSPF interface brief, we're gonna have nothing there either. All right, so let's do a do show IP interface brief. So if we, another way of doing a network statement would be to say we care about every single bit matching. And so what we could say is to the router, hey, listen, uh, here's your network statement, but we want the wildcard mask is all zeros. And that way it literally has to match all 32 bits of the network portion in the network statement have to match an interface IP address in order for that interface to become part of OSPF. So to do that, we're gonna go ahead and do a config, or we're in router configuration mode. So we'll do a network statement for 10.16.0.254. And then for the wildcard mask, we're gonna say 0000. And what that means is that, hey, everything has to match. The wildcard is not giving anything away. So the 10 has to match, the 16 has to match, the zero has to match, the 254 has to match. And if so, we say to the router, if you've got an interface with that exact IP address, we wanna add that associated network that's associated on that interface to OSPF. So we would add that to area zero and do show IP OSPF interface brief. And there it is. So the other thing I, that I wish, you know, like all these things that I learned late, not late, but weren't really apparent to me was this, even if we use a network statement in OSPF that says match exactly on the 32 bits for an interface IP address, it doesn't mean that that 32 bit route, because it's not a route, becomes part of OSPF. It means um, that network statement says match on an interface that has that IP address. The router says, yep, I got one. And then it infers, oh, and by the way, whatever network you're connected to on that interface that matched the network statement, that's the network that we want to become part of OSPF. So even though we matched on all 32 bits with this network statement, we're just gonna get whatever network happens to be connected to that interface. In this case, it's loopback one. So to show, to verify that, um, <laughs> that's a directly connected network, so it's not gonna show up as an OSPF. But here's the network. So this network 10.16.0, with the 24-bit mask is what would be actually added to OSPF. So the network statement says where to check. The router looks at all of its interfaces, identifies which ones match based on the network statement, and then whatever networks are connected to those interfaces are lopped into OSPF in the specified area. So let's do um, let's do another example, and let's actually uh, let's crank it up a little bit and make it a little more fun. Another interface that we have. Let me bring this back. Uh, let me go ahead and choose layers here. Another interface that we have is um, this guy right here, loopback 1, 10, 14, 3.1 with a 24-bit mask. And for this one, let's have, let's have a little bit of fun and let's do this. Let's say that we want a network statement that tells the router just to match. Let me go ahead and bring up another layer here. Let's say we want to match just on this first number. So in our network statement, we could do something like this, network 10.0.0.0. So wherever you don't care about matching, you can just put zeros there. So we're going to represent full 32 bits. And then for the wildcard mask, if we wanted to care about matching just the 10, but not the rest, the wildcard mask would say, we care about the first octet, but we don't care couldn't care less about the second octet or the third octet or the fourth octet like that. And that would rep and then we'd put in area zero. So these last three 255s, which are 24 contiguous bits would say, we don't care about matching on this one or this one or this one, just like that. Also, if we chose to do that, and we had this interface of 10.16.0.1 and 10.14.3.1, and we were just matching on 10, this one network statement would match on this guy, it'd match on this guy, and as a result, it would include both of those interfaces in OSPF with just that one network statement that said, I care about matching just on the 10. So we can verify that and uh, prove that in the lab. So let's go back to our lab. And here it is, all right. 
So I'm going to take off the network statement we just did. I'm putting the, I use the up arrow keys and just doing a control A to go to the beginning saying no. And let's do a do show IP protocols. And I just want to verify we have no network statements. And as a result, we have currently no interfaces that match. And as a result, no networks associated with those interfaces. So let's add on interface loopback zero. I'm sorry, interface loopback one. We just did zero. And interface loopback one, we're going to have the IP address of 10.14. Dot three dot one with a twenty four bit mask. Boom and do show IP interface brief. So now we've got two interfaces. They both start with ten and they're different starting with the third, second, and third octets. So let's go back to our router configuration and we'll use a network statement that says I want to match on ten. I don't care about the last three octets. And then for the wildcard mask that means that we're going to say zero for the first octet, which means we have to match on the 10. And then for the last three octets, we don't care. That's the second octet. Don't care for the third octet. Don't care about the fourth octet. Whatever it is, hey, do doesn't matter. We're not comparing that. We're not matching that. And then we'll say area zero. And what that will do, it will say any interfaces that have the 10 in the first octet of your IP addresses, you are included. Your networks that are on those interfaces are included as part of OSPF, and we can form adjacencies and send updates and LSAs and everything else, and have a, have a great time. And to verify that, let's do a couple things. We'll do a we'll do a, a do show IP protocols just to verify our network statement. So the first octet we care about, the last three octets we don't, and let's do a do show IP OSPF interface brief. One of my favorite commands of all time. And look at that. We now have loop zero and loop one. They're both part of OSPF area zero because that's what the network statement was where it put it. And now these two networks, 10.16.0 and 10.14.3, based on the mask, are now participating in OSPF. And we can form adjacencies off these respective, <laughs> off these respective interfaces if there were neighbors off those interfaces. OK, so let's just do a quick check on what we've done so far. We've identified. Uh, when we run OSPF, we're going to have a process ID. We identified how the router ID is chosen. We also identified how the network statement works with network and then four octets, four decimal numbers with three periods separating them, identifying what we want to match on, and then the wildcard mask confirming that, okay, here's the part of what you just put in that we want to match on or not match on. And with the wildcard mask, anywhere there's 255, that means that corresponding octet from the IP address of the network statement doesn't matter. And so the router, once we have the network statement, it looks real time whew, down at all of its interfaces and says, OK, which interfaces match based on that network statement? Uh, this one does, that one does, this one does. And then it takes those respective interfaces, enables them as part of OSPF, along with advertising those specific networks that are connected to those interfaces. So whether the networks are 24-bit networks, or 28-bit networks, or 27-bit networks, or 12-bit networks, if the network statement matched on those, those respective networks on those interfaces become part of OSPF and can be shared and communicated and advertised. All right, we've got a couple interfaces to go. Uh, we have interface loopback two and three. Let's add those and then we'll add network statements. I'm going to ask you to help me in identifying what would be the appropriate network statement for those. <laughs> and this is where it gets a little bit more dicey and more fun. So let's add the interfaces. And then we'll go through the logic of calculating what the network statement should be. So for loopback 2, um, I'm looking at my notes here. Loopback 2 is 172.16.64.1 with a 28-bit mask. So let's exit out of router configuration mode and go to interface loopback 2 and give it the IP address of 172.16.64.1 with a 28-bit mask. So I bet you, in fact, I know many of you in this live stream and in this uh, listening to this recording know how to do a 28-bit mask. And for those of you who don't yet, I would encourage you to, to not sign up, but just go ahead and check out the Subnet Sundays. I made a separate playlist for it. It's going to walk through step by step. By the time you're, by the time that's beautiful screen, <laughs> while I reconnect. All right. So the IP address is 1621664.1 with a 28-bit mask. So there's eight bits. Calculate. Uh, what the wildcard mask should be 
exactly for that network. And to do that, let me let me bring out this tool. There it is. Uh, I thought it was there. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, there it is. And let's do this. Um, let's let's do this first, and then we'll go ahead and do this more tricky one. Another way of thinking about the wildcard mask is thinking. Do, 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 boom. Okay, great. So let's imagine that we want, we have the, the 10 network and a slash eight, and we want to match on that. So the mask for this network would be 255. Let me go ahead and put it in blue. If we invert this, it would be a zero here, and the rest would be 255s. And, and that's true, by the way. So if you simply want to invert a mask for a, like a slash eight or a slash 16 or a slash 24, just flip it. So if we had a mask of 255.255.0.0 for the IP for the network, and we wanted a wildcard mask, we would go ahead and use something like 0 0.0.255.255. .255. And if we had a network that was a 24-bit network and the mask was 255.255.255.0, the wildcard mask, the inverse of that, the flip of that would be 0 0.0.0.255. .0 .0 .255. So that's one way of very quickly calculating a wildcard mask if you have a network that's on a nice even boundary. And you can just put in the network that you're connected to and put in the appropriate wildcard mask and it simply says, great, I don't care about basically this wildcard mask because I don't care about that octet, this, you know, or the last octet, and this wildcard mask because I don't care about the last two octets, which are all the host addresses, and this wildcard mask says I don't care, care about the last three octets, which are all host addresses. So the tricky part comes with a network like this. So if we were to build a network statement, a wildcard mask, let me go ahead and clear this off. If we were to build a wildcard mask for this network, uh, let's go ahead and try to flip it. So the mask, and I'll put that in red, in the, the uh, a blue color. So the mask is, two, actually this is the literal mask right there. It's already there. So it's 255.255. .255. Dot 255.240. Dot and for the wildcard mask, uh, what we would do is flip it. So the 255 would be a zero. So our network statement would be 172.16.64.0. And then the wildcard mask would be 0, dot, 0, dot, 0, dot, And then we have this last part. So the tricky part for this last part is that if we look at that last octet, the bit values are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. 32, 64, 128. So if we look at this mask of 240, this mask of 240, I'll draw it right here, would be one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those, and stop. So that's the mask in uh, of 240 right there. It's 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16. And that's the mask. So if we wanted to invert that for the wildcard mask, and I'm going to use a very different color this time to make it uh, stand out. Let's go ahead and use... Um, Let's use green. So for the wildcard mask, if we flipped all those individual bits, it would look like this, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 1, 1. So we flipped the entire octet for the wildcard mask, but for the 240, because some of the bits are on, some of the bits are off, we simply can go to the binary to do it, and that also works. So the wildcard mask in this case would be in binary, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. And if we calculated that up, the answer to that would be where the bits are on. We have um, 8 plus 4 is 12, plus 2 more is 14, plus 1 more is 15. Our wildcard mask for this last octet would be 15. Now, there are uh, several ways of calculating this, but I'd like to also share with you, instead of going to binary, another way of doing it, and that's this. If we know the last number are the last, um, if we know the mask is 240, we can subtract 240, the real mask. We can su subtract that from 255, which is the max, and guess what it equals? <laughs> That's the same number. So when, you, when you're better, when you really, mm, with a better understanding of binary, 
and how binary conversion works between decimal and binary and binary to decimal, which we're going to be covering more and more in our subnet Saturdays. Um, this will become easier and easier. But what I want to do is point out that the wildcard mask is simply saying, if we use this wildcard mask, it would mean this. It would mean, um, so let's write out the statement. So the network statement would be this, network 172.16.64.0, because this is actually the 17.16.64 network based on this mask. The wildcard mask would be zero, we care about matching on the first octet, zero, we care about matching on the second octet, zero, we care about matching on the third, well, <laughs> yeah, we care about matching on the third octet, and then dot 15, which means we care about matching on the first four bits of that last octet, but not care, we don't care about the last four bits of that last octet. And that's because the last four bits would be host addresses, while the first four bits would be actually part of the actual subnet address. So that's what it means. Uh, and that's how the wildcard mask works. Let me see if I, I think I covered all the basics that I wanted to here. So let me clear off this for a moment. And let's do this together. Now that we have this IP address, 1.16.64.1, with a 28-bit 20, mask, if we wanted to create a network statement for that, let's do it together based on the board work we just did. So we'll go to router OSPF1. Let's do a do show IP OSPF interface brief, just to make sure that loopback3, or loopback2 rather, is not in there yet. And let's add a network statement that will include that specific network. So one way of doing it is this. We could say network 172 and then tell the wildcard mask, hey, only match on 172. And then the rest, I don't care about. That would work. And if we did a show IP OSPF interface brief, we now got loopback interface two because it matched on that first octet. But that's, that's too broad. I mean, if we had lots of interfaces that started with 172 and we had lots of sub and lots of subnets and so forth we may not want to include just anything that starts with 172 we want we might want to be more granular so i'm going to do a control a take off that network statement verify that that interface loopback2 is no longer there and now let's make an appropriate and accurate in fact this is the type of uh scenario that not only we want to understand for a production environment but for certification so we might be given choices about you know, which is the correct network statement to use or um, do the correct network statement in a simulation. They're both valid, both valid options in a testing environment. So what we'd want to do is be able to put in the most accurate network statement because that's what they're looking for. So in a situation like this, they're not just asking for a wild card that says, yeah, 172, anything, just bring them all in. They're going to want to have a specific wild card based on that exact subnet. And so based on it being a slash 28, we'd want to use a wildcard with the slat with the dot 15 for that last octet, which says we don't care about the host bits, those last four bits, but we care about everything else up to that point. So if we go back to our router config and we say a network uh, and the interface, I'm just going to go ahead and copy it here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. That's the right interface. Okay. So network 172.16.64.0. And then the wildcard mask would say, we have to match on the first octet, we have to match on the second octet, we have to match on the third octet, and we only have to match on the first four bits of that last octet, which means we don't care about the last four bits, which is 15. And then we'll tuck all of that into area zero. And this is the moment, <laughs> and this is the moment we get to see if our math is correct, because then we can do a show IP OSPF interface brief and see whether or not interface loopback a two shows up or not. If it doesn't, we did something wrong, or if it does, we hopefully got the exact right network. So to verify that, we'll do a couple up arrow keys, show IP OSPF interface brief, and there it is. So that interface, loopback two, is the in, and if we do a show IP protocols, which is nice and handy to see on one screen here, uh, I thought I had it in the cache. Dang, we can increase the history buffer too, but I didn't. So do show IP protocols. And it's there because of this network statement right there. So this network statement says we care about the first 28 bits matching and the last four bits we don't care about because the wildcard mask says we don't care. 
Um, and one way of looking at that is we could take the decimal mask for the 172.16.64 network, which was 240, and subtract that from 255, and that gives us a remainder of 15. The math is the same either way. And then this one statement here, uh, with the network of 10, anything, that's what included loopback zero and loopback one into the party. And I think we should try one more because we had that on our initial whiteboard and let's go ahead and do it. So let's try, not try, let's go ahead and do one additional interface and I'll exit out of configuration mode for router OSPF and let's do interface loopback three. Interface loopback three is IP address 192.168.1.2.25 225, looking at my notes with a 29-bit mask. 29-bit mask, what do you mean? 29? So the first 29 bits are the network and the last three bits, 29, 30, yeah, the last three bits would be the host address. So the appropriate mask for that would be 255, that's the first octet, 255, the second octet, 255, the third octet, and then whatever those bits are for the first five IP address, or first five bits of that last octet. So if you have that memorized, great. If you don't have it memorized yet, you will by the end of subnet Saturdays. So um, that's the IP address and the mask is gonna be 255.255.255 dot. And what I would like to do is walk you through, let's imagine it's crunch time for you. Maybe that crunch time is you're studying. Maybe that crunch time is you're in certification and you're like, oh, what is the mask for that again? What is the mask for a slash 29? Let me walk you through uh, a helpful tip on how to solve that and get it right every time, even if you don't have it memorized. Here it is. You simply write out the powers of, you simply write out the uh, values for the eight bit positions in binary. And they would go like this. This is the decimal values of each of the positions. One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. Great, awesome. And we are going to pretend that this is the end of the third octet and this is the beginning of the fourth octet because we know the mask is going to be 255, 255, 255. And now we need the mask that's going to indicate that we are going to use five more bits. And so we'll just draw them. We're going to use this bit. That's one, two, three, four, five. So we said the mask was going to be a slash 29. So this is the 24 bit mark. So 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. We draw a line there. That's the dividing line. And then we put zeros in the mask for the last three bits because those are going to be host bits. And then you can add them up. So 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 is 248. <laughs> and if you if you added that, you know, if you add it up manually, it'll still be 248. So if you use a calculator or just say 128 plus 64 and do the math longhand, it's 128. As it's 248. So if this is the this is the mask for the interface, so we'll go ahead and put that on. So 248 press enter, da, da 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 And now, if we wanted to add a network statement uh, for OSPF to capture that, that specific network, it would be something like this. We'll go router OSPF1 network 192.168.1. Now, this is where you'd have to know what the network is too. So it's 224, that's the actual network address space. And then we would put in the wildcard. And if you don't, if you don't yet know how to sort that out, stick with us on subnet Sundays and you'll be right as rain before you know it. So then we would go ahead and simply add the wildcard mask of 0, .0, 0, 0.0.0. dot And what we could do here, um, we could do it the long way, you could do it the short way, but if you take 255, which is the maximum value for eight bits in an octet, and you subtract the mask, the current mask, oh, <laughs> Hold on a second, I need to point to the right thing. And you subtract the mask, the current mask right there, 248, and then we get in some really serious math here. So we're gonna borrow that, that'd be 15, eight and eight is 16, that'd be seven, and that's the remainder. So our wildcard bit here would be seven. 255 minus the current mask, or you could do it long way like we did earlier. The math is gonna come out the same. So the wildcard, mask is going to be a wildcard mask of dot seven for that last octet. So let's go ahead and put it in. And you click here and put it in. And then we'll set it to area zero. And if we did this right, when we do a do show IP protocols, 
it will just come on i know it won't give you context sensitive help so there's our network statement we just added 192.168.1.224 and what that means is it cares about matching on the first eight bits here and then the next eight bits and the next eight bits all 24 bits and five of the bits in this last number which is uh, identifying the network and it doesn't care about the last three that's what this seven means seven means i don't care about the last three bits and if we did that right and we do a show ip ospf interface brief which i think is in my history there it is do show ip ospf interface brief we now have interface loopback three as well um because it uh it included that all right so the the network statement we just added matched on the first 29 bits of an interface we had on loopback three and as a result it put that network into, that interface became active for OSPF and it put that interface as part of OSPF. Okay, uh, that is a lot of content right there. Um, wildcard masks and interpreting them and understanding them rely heavily on the knowledge of how IP addresses work and that's why subnetting and the binary conversions and decimal conversions are so important to learn because they're gonna help not just with this, they're gonna help with everything, including routing decisions like why did the router choose this route, not that route? And things like that are going to matter also about understanding that behind the scenes with the binary. Okay, so I wanted to cover a few things in this uh, CCNA Sunday, and let's make sure we did. Number one, I wanted to walk through the process of bringing up OSPF, the, the process ID, and also the router ID, how it's identified and described. Perfect. We then took a look at the, ne the network statements and the network statements and how they work. Basically, it goes it goes on like this. The network statement says to the router, hey, you got any, like go fish, like, like playing the game of fish. Do you have any threes, do you have any fours? Except in this case, the network statement says, hey, do you have any interfaces that begin with these numbers in your IP addresses? And then we can specify how many numbers we care about, how many bits we care about by using the appropriate wildcard masks that indicate what we don't care about. So if we're looking for interfaces again with 10, 16, 0, the wildcard mask associated with that would be 0, 0, 0, meaning we care about those first three octets, and then 255, meaning we don't care about the last octet. If we're working with non-clean boundaries, that's when we have to slice and dice with the wildcard mask. So if the network is 29 bits, the wildcard mask should say we don't care about the last three bits. Or if the network is 12 bits, the wildcard mask should say we don't care about anything else about beyond that for matching purposes. And there is there is one other um, option I'd like to share with you real quick, and that is this. If we want it to be very specific, let's create one more interface. Interface uh, loopback 5, and let's give it the IP address of 67.83.1.2. With a two octet mask. All right, so it, the first two network, two first two numbers of the network, last two are the host address, and it didn't like that trailing period. I don't know why. Okay, so there's our IP address. Another option is we could be very specific with OSPF and say, hey, OSPF, match on all 32 bits. And here's how we do that in router OSPF configuration mode, we'd say network. And I'm just going to copy paste to save myself any typos. Network and then a 0000, zero, zero, zero area 0. And what that means is I care about matching on the 67. The second zero says I care about matching on the 83. The third zero in the mask says I care about the matching on the 1. And the fourth zero in the wildcard mask says I care about matching on the 4. And if one, if one bit is off and it doesn't match, that interface and its associated network won't be lopped into OSPF. If it does match, we will be. And that'd be another way of being very, I mean, the most accurate network statements would be a 32-bit match, which is what this is requiring right here. So if we did a show IP OSPF interface brief, uh, we now have loopback five, and also this 16-bit network, 67.83, would now be participating and involved with OSPF, even though we did a, a network statement that says the whole interface IP address had to match. Once it matches, whatever interfaces, whatever networks are associated with that interface are going to be considered part of OSPF. And then from this perspective, we can do a show IP route. And let me go ahead and get out the L's. 
exclude the capital L. There we go. So here are the <laughs> oh, oh, that was so <laughs> that was a huge fail. I was like, how come everything disappeared? That's because I have loopback interfaces with the capital L on all those. So my bad. So let's go back and just do the normal command, show IP route. So all of these routes, the 1014.3, the 10.16.0, the 67.83 with 16-bit mask, the, uh, here we go, the 172.16.64 network with a 28-bit mask, and the 192.168.1.224 network with a 29-bit mask. Those, all those interfaces and those associated networks uh, that they're running on, uh, those networks are participating and being advertised in OSPF. And that's, that's the basics of the network statement that I wanted to share with you in this video or in this live stream regarding OSPF and network statements specifically on the wildcard mask. Now, where else are wildcard masks going to raise their heads and, and, and provide you with satisfaction by understanding how they work? The answer is access control lists. So with extended ACLs and uh, even standard ACLs with a wildcard mask, you can specify with a match, you know, which part of the IP address you're supplying you care about. And it works the same way as the network statement. If there's a zero in the wildcard mask, it means you have to match exactly on that corresponding set of eight bits in the IP address. And where the wildcard mask has bits that are on, those exact bits in the IP address, we don't care about. They could be anything. So they could be a range of host addresses or all the host addresses in a subnet because the wildcard masks can indicate we don't care about them. Well, that's it for this session of CCNA Sunday on OSPF, specifically on wildcard masks. I appreciate you being here. Our next live stream is um, next, what day is it, Sunday? The next live stream is Wednesday, and then there's going to be two more on Saturday and Sunday with Subnet Saturday and also CCNA Sunday coming up. Uh, so did I say Wednesday? <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, so much fun. So Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'll come up with live streams. Also, um, I'm just ending, I had a, let me show you real quick. I purchased a couple of home Wi-Fi mesh systems uh, like six to eight months ago. I, I got Google Wi-Fi and I also got the Amplify. I use Google Wi-Fi here in my home, in the recording studio and in my home in Vegas, which is about 15 miles away. I, uh, I put this one in. And so I, I bought two of each. And what I did was I was going to do an unboxing, you know, like for uh, a YouTube unboxing. Never got around to it. Really, really busy with everything going on with all the content we're creating. So I didn't unbox it. And so I did a giveaway. And uh, so if you find me on social, it's posted many places, I'm sure. It's limited to the U.S. because I have to ship it. I had com people come in and saying, uh, Keith, how come it's not good over here or there? It's like, I've got to ship this thing. And so um, it's about a $300-ish value. Uh, I think it sells on Amazon for like $339 or something. It's sealed. I love it. It is one of my favorite home Wi-Fi mesh systems. It's elegant. This light we'll get here. It looks like an Apple product. It's just you touch the front and it tells you the megabits per second. It tells you the aggregate throughput and the port status and... Um, Wi-Fi protected setup, if you want that, that's available on a button and it glows at the bottom. Anyway, it's great. So I'm not sponsored by Ubiquity, but I love this product and that is part of the giveaway that ends tomorrow. So that competition or that, that giveaway ends tomorrow at, um, I'll include it with the link for this, but it ends tomorrow at some point. So if you want to participate in that, please feel free to do so. Um, again, three things I'd like you to do before you go. If you like the video or got value out of it, hit the like button. Two, find a study buddy, something to study with and practice with and, and bounce ideas off of. And third, please subscribe so you can always get latest alerts of what's going on here. The two playlists I would have you in mind for would be the master playlist here on YouTube for CCNA 200-301 and the, um, the CCNA, the subnet Saturday, I'm making a separate playlist as well. So if you just wanna focus on the subnetting and learn from the ground up how that works, That'd be the place for you. Or if you want to go through all of it, the master playlist, I add videos to both of those every single week. All right. Thank you very much for your patience today. It's been great having you. I enjoy doing this. It's, it's really a pleasure. And when my equipment's working, it's even better. <laughs> and I just realized that uh, I don't have any exit music queued up, but let me cue some up. It'll be worth it. Also, for those who, who've asked about my exit music and intro music, I use uh, epicsound.com. I have a subscription. 
and I get a lot of my content from that. So here's a song. It's called A Little Bit of Faith by Melina Stark. Thanks, everybody. See you in the next stream.